Should I kick it off? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good morning. Um, yeah, so this is our, our roundup um, to try to, to narrow down our recommendations um, in response to the House Speaker's letter. Um, just quickly, we'll go over the agenda, um, much like the last time we met last Friday, uh, reviewing sort of the poll two results and um, narrowing down the recommendations that came from that. And then um, we'll look at the draft letter again um, and also talk about um, some potential changes um, or additions to that that we um, were thinking of but didn't include yet and get your input on that. Um, we have a, a recommendations table that we'll walk through to, to try to help us um, narrow all this down and decide what we want to include in the letter. And then um, next steps, which will have to happen rather quickly because we're aiming to get something uh, to the council, I believe by early next week is the goal. So does anybody have anything else that needs to be added or changed for the agenda? Great, so we should get right to it. Um, do we wanna um, just, I don't know, we just posted the minutes from last week. So um, I don't know if folks have had a chance to look at those or if we want to kind of re come back to that to see if there's any edits needed. I had one comment and I wanted to bring that up, but um, does anyone, maybe we'll, we'll do that and then see if we need to come back, we can. Um, my comment was on the, um, I don't know if folks have it open or not, but on the, the two main points that Catherine used to disseminate the data, um, I just was wondering if that second bullet was worded the way it should be, that d disaster recovery funding from state or federal government as a new program to provide more capacity. I was just wondering if we should edit it to take out the disaster recovery and just say funding from or for new for re, new resources and um, capacity or something like that, rather than to talk about disaster recover um, funding specifically. See nodding heads. Any objections? What, what, I'm sorry. What is the distinction between the two? Uh, I think there's different types of funding, and I don't think we were just talking about disaster recovery funding. I think we're talking about funding to support communities, to support state That's, capacity and resources. So just sort of a distinction there that it's not just disaster recovery funding. To me, that has a distinct meaning. So I okay, just so to... you, you feel disaster recovery is too narrow? Yeah. To allow more proactive work, Andrea? Yes, yeah, exactly. Um. Yeah, Paula, you had a comment? Yeah, I'm wondering, well, first of all, I'm just wondering if we can have it up on the screen. Um, I think that might help, but um, the, sure. the thing about that particular bullet is that I was um, sort of summarizing her four points. Um, and so that is what she asked for. And so- Oh, hold um, on. Let me just share the screen. Yeah, because we're talking about the minutes. Oh, the the minutes. oh the minutes. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'll definitely get into that later. Got it. Thank you. I was confused. I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> so any objections to um, just starting that bullet with funding rather than disaster recovery funding? And uh, has everybody had a chance to review it? Do, do uh, folks need more time to review the minutes? before we decide that they are approved or as amended? Mm, not seeing any. I, 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 and I'm sorry, I'm probably uh, exposing myself for being adult, but I have not seen these minutes. Um, and did, did I miss something or? They were just posted, um, and I believe, Marion, they're posted with today's um, agenda and minutes and other documents that we'll be reviewing today. So it, we we did just get them out. Um, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before. So they were just posted. We can drop a link in the chat and folks can look at them while we're talking. And then we can circle back at the end to make sure there's no further edits that need to be made. 
That sounds good. All right, let's do that. And I will stop sharing for now then. I can't figure it out. This, is, this is Sue that was taking the minutes. Those are That was my fault. I had two days of no power and uh, I thought that they went out, but <laughs> apparently they did not. So my apologies. No problem, Sue. Um, yeah, so folks probably do need a little bit more time. I don't think apologies are necessary either. And I, I'm not sure that it is absolutely mandatory at the very next meeting that you approve minutes from previous meetings. Mm -hmm. I, uh, You know, we can let it slide for a meeting. Yep. Well, why don't we circle back at the end and if folks feel comfortable that they've been able to multitask during the meeting, <laughs> um, we can do that. Otherwise we can come back to it our next meeting. You're right. Okay. Let's dig in then. Okay, well, to David's point, a lot of materials went out uh, in very short notice, um, including the poll, which we only gave you 24 hours to turn around. So first, thanks for those of you who were able to do that. Last night, uh, sent out the results from that poll along with some the revised <clears throat> draft letter. So I don't know how much time you've had to to really look closely at that, but we will take the time during this meeting to make sure that that any points of clarification are, are covered or any questions. Um, so the materials that we sent out last night um, included sort of presenting the poll results in two ways. And I'm gonna share my screen now to just show you kind of all the various, if I can find share screen, all the various, oh. uh, Ah, there it is. Uh, the entire poll. Um, so all the all the poll results, and I have hopefully made it a little clearer in how I'm presenting it now. So there was some color color coding in there that may have confused you, um, both in the type and in the and just in the cell. So gotten rid of all that. I have highlighted in red. If you should be able to see now, the top five vote getters, um, which is not to say they may, those are the only ones that we may want to consider, but thought it might be easier for you to see those immediately. And I know that we got some comments um, from Andrea, um, some comments and clarifications. And I wanted to make sure that we had time for, for Andrea who has to leave early. We got some other suggestions um, and there may be other people who didn't send those in writing, but do have some questions about these results. So <clears throat> let's start there. Let's just sort of open it up for discussion. If anybody had any questions about how these these results came out or any questions about the specific actions. And I'm just gonna I'm gonna just leave it here so I don't make everybody crazy by moving the slides around. Catherine, but sorry to interrupt. Could you just zoom in on those columns? It's pretty hard to see on my screen. Sure. Let me make it a Thank little you. Uh, let's see what uh, I can do. Down on the bottom right, there's like a little scrolly bar with the plus sign. If you head that way, you can, uh, very bottom right of the Excel file. Ah, yes. I was trying to get to my Zoom. You're, you've got the quick action. Thank you. Thank that you. Perfect? Yes, that helps a lot. The other thing that I, you'll see here is we added the strategy column uh, because as the work group was looking at these results, we thought that might be helpful. And just as kind of going back to how some of these fell under the same strategies uh, and does that you know tell us anything more? So we just added those into the column C that you have now. Um, so I want to open up, Anne, I know you have to leave early. Do you want to raise some of the, the, the uh, points that you made? Is Anne here? It was, yeah, there. yeah she is. Yeah, she is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hope I offer these, um, in hopefully the, uh, constructive spirit of trying to make actionable recommendations. Um, I think, uh, these comments have to do with the, um, uh, recommendations that are related to the buildings and energy side of things. Um, just so folks know, I work on sort of the energy supply and grid side of things at the department. And when these rose to the top, I said, I better run these by my colleagues who work on weatherization and codes. 
um, and, and building efficiency. Um, so just a few items on um, pathway. Let's see, it was action S2, let's see. It's the one about audit existing building codes. So probably need to. That's this one right here. Oh yeah, okay, Not it didn't rise to the top five, but it's still in the top here. Mm -hmm. It says audit existing residential building codes and uh, in Vermont, we don't have single family residential building codes. We, um, these, I, mean, I mean, construction codes, there's a commercial building construction code and that would apply to um, multifamily residential buildings that are over three stories in height. Um, so if the idea is to audit, you know, single family building codes, there's really nothing to audit. There are residential building energy standards. So those are different than construction codes. They have to do with um, sort of the, the energy side of things. So the building shell and the equipment that's put into the buildings. And it has to do with the efficiency of that equipment, not necessarily where it's placed. That would be likely more under the purview of uh, a construction code or a building code. So we weren't sure whether this was meant to apply to the energy standards or it was meant to um, recommend, I think, I, w I went back and looked at the um, some of the earlier documents when this subcommittee was trying to come up with its list of um, action items. And there was one that actually recommended adoption statewide of residential building codes. So I don't know where that kind of, if that still exists somewhere or it fell out somewhere, um, but there is uh, some reconciliation that probably needs to happen there. And I guess the only other item on that one was that, uh, we have one person in the department who works only part of their job on um, the re residential building energy standards. And they have passed along to me that um, even if funding were attached to this, we would have some staff constraints around doing this kind of audit or even overseeing a contractor doing this kind of audit. So those were the two things is just think about the resources required and whether this actually is recommending something that um, applies to a, a code that doesn't exist in Vermont. Um, and then the other the other thought, if you want me to dive into the other ones on, on weatherization, I'd appreciate um, the opportunity if now's the time. Uh, the I just, and can I, can I just ask on, a question? Oh, yeah, please. I have a comment Sorry. on that last one too. Yeah. Go ahead, Stephanie. Sorry, thanks. I was just going to say, um, the for what it's worth, we have funding through FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Fund program, specifically around building codes. So it's $2 million for the state to do building code work. And the Division of Fire Safety, who manages the commercial building code for the state, is planning to put in an application in January to do an assessment of what it would take to have a residential building code and what it would look like if they were managing it, what the impact would be on the ground. Um, so just for everyone's awareness, that is ongoing work, hopefully. Thanks, Stephanie. And I, I understand there's been, um, you know, work group that came out of some legislative requirements to look at codes and that there may be a lot of code activity in the in the state house this coming session. If I could just add quickly, um, I think those are excellent points to be aware of. And I, I am also curious to know if within that potential funding around codes, how much of that is dedicated towards sort of the um, inspection and enforcement of codes. My understanding from where energy codes or building codes fall short is if they're, you know, if you can't verify compliance by having a robust network of building inspectors and, and you know, professionals that can verify that the code is being um, met, then there's, it's really, it's just not as effective. So without that enforcement, it's, I, I question how helpful auditing codes to begin with is. Yeah, I I understand. You know, we've definitely heard that message. I I I have a feeling that the um, I mean, the enforcement piece would obviously uh, entail a great deal of of resources, and whether those would apply to a building code versus an energy code, and um, relate to the department or the division of fire safety under the Department of Public Safety. That's um another set of kind of thorny issues.
Yeah, Paula. Hi, sorry. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, if we were, so first of all, like, this only got five votes. Um, so I think this conversation is helping us decide, like, sort of like, yay or nay on whether to even keep it. Um, one thing that I'm sort of gleaning from this conversation, personally, is that um, it's probably a good idea for us to um, consider, like, I mean, I think an audit of existing residential building codes would expose immense gaps in both, um, you know, the energy side and the um, more direct resilience side, like flood proofing and stuff. Um, so it might be a good thing to include and just have some notes like, um, you know, about, you know, there's not a residential building code um, for low rise multifamily and um, single family. But um, yeah, the other part is it sounded to me, and maybe somebody who knows more about it can just clarify, it sounded like the legislature has already um, maybe asked about building codes, or maybe that's coming more directly from these grants from FEMA. Um, but yeah, maybe it's not something that we need to get behind if it's already in progress. Yeah, thanks, Paula. <clears throat> yes, I hope this, you know, this discussion will sort of illuminate some of the either clarifications that need to be made alongside these recommendations um, and also help people decide whether they want to, you know, again, take some of the lower votes up to the top. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, Anne, I think, yeah, if you would continue, you did have a couple of other points. If there are points on things that didn't get, you know, got one vote, maybe we don't need to discuss that now, but if they got if there are points on the other recommendations that did get seven, five, that would be helpful. Okay. If you uh, wouldn't mind scrolling through, um, I just don't have the red coding on my version. So uh, let's see the weatherization uh, navigators. The, the only comment there, hopefully this is a positive thing is that uh, we believe, and maybe Marion could um, speak to this more, but that the climate action office is looking to include this in the Climate Pollution Reduction at, uh, Grant application. Um, so, I, you know, on all of these, obviously, resources are um, it, where the resources will come from is the, a big question. But it thinks there may be resources coming to this one. Yeah, thanks for including that note, Anne. I don't know the answer, but I've messaged Megan, and so hopefully we'll get an answer before the end of this meeting. Thanks skip the ones that had fewer votes. Um, you wouldn't mind scrolling down, please. That's the last one. Okay, so I'll reserve the rest of my comments. Thank you. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, I just want to make sure that we have in the back of our minds as we're talking about these is that obviously we want to highlight things that need legislative action. And I, a question that came to mind for me was, for instance, on this one, the auditing existing residential building codes, what would be the legislative action needed for that to move forward? Or is that something that a state agency could do on their own without any legislative action? Yeah, David. Um, in fact, uh, I was going to suggest that, one, there are building codes. There are not statewide building codes, except for things like plumbing, electricity, uh, and, and other uh, systems that go into homes. Um, and when in doubt, the legislature conducts a study. And uh, since I don't think anybody recently has touched on the issue of a statewide building code for the purposes of climate change, uh, we could suggest that as an action that the legislature could take in order to move this forward. Is that, so that would be the first step before they, 
And then after that, would they need to then authorize a actual statewide building code be drawn up? Yes, it would be at, uh, at least a two-step process. One, to complete the study and determine the value or lack thereof of a statewide building code uh, for the purposes of climate. And uh, then uh, to take action based on the results of the study. Okay. It's something the legislature uh, does when they're dealing with an issue that hasn't come up before. They okay. educate themselves about it. Thanks for the clarification. I, I had that question on a couple of these and, and I, obviously I don't know. So, um, so other folks, um, I know uh, we got some comments from, um, I'm sorry. Marion, you were going to bring up some comments from Bronwyn, who isn't able to join us today, Did, or is that more of a lumping and not a clarification? Uh, it's more lumping, not clarification. So, so I'm going to that and we get to talking about how we're going to present these. Um, any other questions, clarifications, um, any information about? you know, where think that some of these might already have some undergoing actions or activities for implementation that we don't aren't aware of. People, any questions about the results or anything that you see that didn't at least get a five that you feel like needs to have some discussion? What is the number that we need to get that we would take it forward? Good question. Um, so that's up to you. Uh, there wasn't a specific ask on a, a number of recommendations. The ones that receive seven and sixes, uh, there are five of those. If you were to go down the next level to the fives, there's four more of those. So that would be nine total. Uh, and then there's one four. So you could keep dropping, obviously, but that our intent was to try to narrow this. So um, I think, you know, it's, it's up to you obviously, but, um, I think at one point, David, you said six would be perfect. I, you know, I think this is somewhat arbitrary. And if we, we also had some discussion about trying to, you know, to lump these together, if they were, um, uh, yeah, I actually, I didn't hold forth on six. I held forth after I had done a clumping of yeah. what I thought are related issues based on the legislative forum where they're going to hear these issues, what the committee jurisdictions were. So it, it uh, in terms of the, I, I made no claim for a number, just that's the way it broke out. Yeah. So uh, organization that I did. Yeah. Well, and we'll talk about that next. Uh, Paula, did you have some clarification questions or comments? Uh, no, I wanted to ask about things that didn't receive a high number of votes. So if that's not yeah. what we're on, I'll, I'll No, that. yes, I would love to hear that. Yeah, okay. uh, Catherine, if I could, I, I happened to go to a meeting of uh, area legislators last evening. And um, along with the 270 some bills that were introduced last session in the House, there are already 250 drafting requests in for this coming year's uh, session of the House. Um, just to give some an idea of the uh, workload that the legislature is looking at. Mm -hmm. There are fewer bills in the Senate, but eventually all of the House bills that do get action, do get funneled to the Senate, plus whatever they introduce. Um, I think you've gone beyond the pale of what the legislature can deal with if you go to six. I would argue that we've got to cut this down at least in half of that in, in terms of expecting action this year. I'm not suggesting that we give up on the priorities and, in fact, that they should be mentioned but if we are going to prioritize, I would make it less than six. That's for sure. Thanks, David. Paula? Yeah, really appreciating the 
the context that you're bringing to this, David. I think it's helpful. Um, so one of the ones that I wanted to ask people about, like, why didn't you vote for it, basically, is um, the statewide climate change impact assessment um, for the commercial sector um, and natural resource-based industries. Um, Which because like for me that it's a uh, number 21 in the poll. Um, I don't, or I don't know if that number, that numeration was preserved in your yes. um, chart. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So it's the very last one. And like, it seems to me like this is absolutely essential, but maybe it's already being done. Maybe, um, you know, having grown up in Ohio in the eighties, like I know what it looks like when an economy collapses. Um, so I'd rather not live through that. So I think that question goes to anybody who didn't vote for that, that, you know, did not see that as a priority. If you have any thoughts, reactions. Um, my reaction was that those industries are doing it already. Um it is not part of government. I, I agree that um, it, it, you know, it's not part of government, but ski areas uh, not in collusion with each other, uh, the corporations, but they certainly have a strategy for how they're going to deal with what is coming at them for climate change. They have just too much money invested to ignore it. Uh, sugaring, eh, since that's so much of a backyard activity, but there's maybe not as much information on that. Um, and then logging, um, boy, if there's anything that's studied, it's our forests. And uh, whether it's the uh, U.S. Forest Service with the Green Mountain, Mountain National Park or, um, you know, independ independent landowners, but the um, use value program is is a, a world of data and uh, of long-term data. So a lot of that's out there. I didn't see using resources to do this work or redo this work. Maybe we could make an effort to gather it. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. Any others, Anne? Anne Lawless? Thank you. I hope this is the right time to make this comment. Um, well, for starters, I appreciate David's suggestion that we lower, we keep a, a very small number of recommendations because the legislature is so is so busy doing other things, as Paula also agreed. Um, my comment was about the um the tax credit program supporting that. I'm I'm just I'm just concerned that. A lot of people who live in our villages these days do not have the capacity to take advantage of a tax credit. I don't know the stats on that, but our villages have changed a lot. They used to be places where the prosperous professionals in our community lived who weren't on farms in the rural areas, but that's no longer true. There's traffic impacts. The I think the values of those properties have gone down over time relatively so i'm just i mean i think it's a great recommendation um it should be done of course like so many of our other recommendations just any any thoughts on that thank you and that was number it's the very it's the very top i think it's the very top one on your list Catherine. yeah yes there it is number one And there really wasn't a lot of most of the recommendations for to Im increase weatherization didn't rise to the top. The the navigator one at the RPCs, that's in there, but there really isn't a lot of support from our group here to expand, to look at expanding the resources uh, for the WAPs, the weatherization assistance programs, or the other or any of the other programs that do that kind of work. But I don't want to be a haranguer. Just, I know we have to move forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Uh, reactions to Anne's comment, particularly about number one, which did get a lot of votes. Um, 
Paula? Yeah, I think that that's a super helpful comment that like it takes a certain level of capacity and like even having a tax burden to take advantage of a tax credit. Um, so I think that's a really, um, really astute uh, point. I wonder if we could, like, I wonder if we're developing this kind of um, thing where we're sort of like, maybe it's a new column in the table, like extra notes. And um, maybe we could say, like, if we accept this one as one we want to send, we can say, consider other mechanisms for, um, you know, making these changes. Um, and then, um, Anne, can you remind me what the second thing you were talking about was? Oh, the weatherization. So I, the reason I voted for the the sort of like main one um, with the RCPs and the navigators um, is because it seemed like that would solve a lot of problems in the immediate future. And then after that's in place, we can look at like, what are the remaining gaps, I guess. Um, so that was kind of the mindset I had when I when I voted. Oops, sorry. I missed this one. Thanks. Um, yeah, Allie. Thank you. Yeah, and I I really appreciate Anne's comment, and I, I do think I I uh, will admit I need to spend more time looking at this document, and I'm hoping to do so today to provide some more feedback. I'm still uh, figuring out in my new role on the Climate Council how to make sure I'm seeing all the emails that are not coming in to my, also my professional email account, so I'm a little behind. Um, but I'm really glad that Anne raised that about the weatherization assistance programs in particular. And as someone who works for a regional planning commission, um, the if the navigator role is interesting, but there we've been in a position lately where um, we are tasked with, and this is sort of an ongoing, that is the role of RPCs in many ways, we're already doing that work. So I, I'm curious to understand the, the nuance and what that navigator role looks like, how it gets propped up. Um, does that mean adding new capacity to RPCs? And is that truly necessary when there are dedicated organizations out there that are already doing weatherization work like NEDOs, like the heat squads, um, like I'm, I'm thinking of in my region, specifically in the Northeast Kingdom, like NECA, all the community action agencies. So should it be placed on the RPCs as their main responsibility or are there other organizations that we can all that prop up more successfully to do that weatherization work that I think is really key to building this community resilience? And perhaps more so than the tax credits, which I agree can be uh, burdensome to navigate and add a layer of complexity that perhaps is is not as ne not necessary. I know we talked a bit about this navigator recommendation last time, um, and sort of what uh, you know how that additional cap capacity could help coordinate some of the existing programs you're mentioning. Ali, I don't know if others want to speak to why you think it's important, why you voted for it to stay at the top. This is Anne, Anne Lawless. I voted for it because it was one of the few things that actually added capacity to help people and the the to help people navigate through the huge array of programs that already exist. I mean, I think I'm in Ali's region, NBDA region, and um, Ali as our energy planner, you know, does an excellent job of keeping all the energy committees and everybody else who's working on the ground together. Uh, keeping us aware of what's what the resources are and how we can help people. And I think the other agencies that Ali mentioned, like NEDO, and, which is our WAP, our Weatherization Assistance Program, and NECA, we do a good job in our region of, of working together, especially thanks to Ali. But the need is great. And from what I hear, it's, it's the complexity is, is just going to get worse. So... I'm all for asking for more help 
<laughs> but of course it needs to be in the right place as you as you say ali any other questions comments i uh, yeah. have a comment uh in general uh my votes were based around things that were actionable items so you know move the mobile yeah. homes out of floodplains uh create dollars for uh critical infrastructure things like that and the reason those or where the boats landed for me was because in my professional life, we've been living climate change for probably the last 10 years. And literally every year and month that goes by, it continues to get more frequent, more. This storm we're looking at for Sunday, as an example, was supposed to be all rain. Now, all the Northern Vermont smaller utilities are looking at a foot of heavy wet snow again for the third Sunday in a row. That's not what we used to experience here. So uh, we need to act now. And uh, I gave this, and i sorry I couldn't be here last week. I uh, had another commitment. But, you know, anything we can do now versus continuing to study and things like that, I think is really what we need to concentrate on. Uh, because the actions that we have taken so far, not we as in Green Mountain Power or electric necessarily, but VTrans and others, uh, they've all really worked and helped. And uh, so I am expressing my hope that we hit actionable items that can really move things forward right now. Uh, my last comment is uh, we all, some of us also entered comments and requests, and I just don't know where or when we'll talk about those, uh, but that's what I had. Thank you. Actually, thank you for that reminder. Um, and please do, if you want to raise your comments, there were three comments uh, in the results that I did not share with the with this table. So uh, for those of you who did enter comments, I know, um, please do raise them now for the whole group to I don't know, Michael, if you, if you, Did you want me to keep going. Yes, yes Catherine, yeah, thank do. you. So uh, <laughs> I, I raised and entered a comment on, uh, we have uh, identified an equity thing across Vermont and, and what it is, it has to do with uh, Act 250 and distribution lines, the lines that just go along the road to your feed your homes, not transmission lines, not anything like that, but literally the lines that go down the road to feed your homes. Uh, there are three utilities in the state of Vermont that were regulated under Act 250 only in one acre towns. Uh, all municipal uh, departments uh, did not have this requirement. They were exempt. And then the three utilities that were uh, regulated under Act 250 only had it in one acre towns, which I don't know if people know the history. If you are a 10 acre town, that means you have a zoning board that you work with and that takes the place of Act 250. So uh, we worked with the legislature last year to get that, get an exemption out through 2026 as we've had some uh, storm hardening projects right along fully developed state highways, things like that, that have been held up for five years in permitting. Uh, as we continued to get hit by storm after storm after storm. In the past 12 months, we had six uh, major storms, including three of the worst in the history of Green Mountain Power. So we asked for that exemption. The uh, legislature granted it. Uh, I had the bill number and everything in there. And what we're looking for is to keep that, uh, make that permanent beyond so that we can continue to take action now to uh, get our lines storm hardened uh, so that we can face this weather and keep our customers and our coworkers safe in their homes. Uh, what I would say is we already have best management practices that we worked with A&R on that already uh, address all environmental issues, A and B. We also, uh, the exemption is only for existing state and town roads that are fully developed. So I'm not saying if we go through a uh, greenfield that we cut trees and open up a new right of way. That's not the exemption. The exemption is just state highways, town highways, and 
electrical lines that are already there. So that was the comment I made. Thank you. And just to be clear, are, are you would you suggest that that something be added to the Act 25 recommendation uh, to address some of these concerns you're raising? I the, ultimately, I think a recommendation from RRA, if agreed to, that that was made permanent. I do believe it's already being added to a bill anyway. But I think the the power of this committee, if, if that was supported by this committee, it never hurts, right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, but what you're pointing out is that it, it isn't part of the existing action plan. Uh, that particular clarification or exemption. Okay. Not that I know of. It was separately worked with uh, the House on and passed the House and then was sent to the Senate and passed the Senate. But it's a short time frame right now. Got it. Thanks. Stephanie? Thanks, Catherine. Um, I'll be quick and I apologize. I have to jump at 10, but I have two, two comments. So one on number three, I said this last time, I think it's great that we do that, but the problem I have is if we're going to say expand the existing program, we need to tell them what program we're talking about yeah. because they're not going to know. And I have a program that can do this through the Flood Resilient Communities Fund. ACCD has programs that are in this space. I don't know what program we're talking about. Um, so that's my comment on that one. Um, so you say there's two that already address this? So the, the Flood Resilient Communities Fund is in this space. ACCD has programs in this space also. So I don't I don't actually know. I'm in this world and I don't know what program we're talking about. So they're definitely going to be confused. Uh, flood, should flood well, it should be, shouldn't that be in the, are we in the right number there? No, that's three. Catherine? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. But then it's ACCD also, and this might be talking about ACCD programs. I'm not sure. And then I'm going to give my other one now before people jump in, because I have to jump off at 10, but my other comment is on 19, which is establish a dedicated program. And that program exists. It's, it's the state flood resilient communities fund and we don't, it's ARPA funded now and we're out of money. So it's create a permanent program for the, like it's the, whatever the next iteration of the Flood Resilient Communities Fund is. So expansion of existing Flood Resilient Communities Fund. 945. On that one, Stephanie, is it, um... Does that program that you're talking about that exists, does it do all of the things on this list? Um, like yes. the easements and everything? Okay, thanks. Yes, so it does. And 20 is a broadening mm -hmm. of it, but I know I at least one legislator is proposing a the future expansion of the program and what that looks like to, be, to go beyond just flooding, um, which is what 20 is intended to be beyond flooding. So based on the ARPA requirements, the existing program had to be flood focused, mm -hmm. but whatever the future iteration is would not have to be flood focused. So our program already does things beyond flooding. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. A couple hands went up immediately. Uh, David, in response to anything that or something. Uh, yeah. In response to Michael's question and then your question back to him, whether it's part of the action plan, we have in this document built in hardening infrastructure and, um, you know, water and uh, wastewater treatment and, you know, uh, what we're talking about, even though it's in the hands of a private corporation, is a public service. So hardening and, and uh, working on power lines would seem to fit as part of that priority. And that's one of the high ones, if I remember correctly, meaning it has the number of votes. Yeah, there is one that has identified critical infrastructure that needs uh, investment, I believe. Well, that, in my opinion, that uh, the power certainly fits that having been without power in one of the spring storms for 72 hours. Uh, I certainly want Green Mountain Power on the case after that experience. 
Yes, David, I agree. Thank you. In, in mine, it, it just didn't cover the addition of that exemption. Uh, to make it permanent. But I agree, it does already cover, I believe, even funding, right? Increase the resilience. Yes. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting that it requires funding for Green Mountain Power. They have their own structure for getting funds to do things through the PUC as a certificate of public good and all of that. I'm not suggesting we touch that, but if it will help in terms of the political relief from permitting for a specific period of time, then let's just include the language and offer that help. I like that idea. Thank you. So in my, taking my notes here, I just want to be clear. So the suggestion would be as kind of a clarification for this, if this were to be one of the recommendations, number 13, that we would uh, perhaps raise up the example that you presented, Michael, of you know what is needed to actually be able to implement the hardening of distribution lines specifically. The current exemption is specific to that. Uh, it it doesn't include water, wastewater, uh, things like that. But the the current exemption, I think, speaks to. Uh, communications, broadband, and uh, electrical energy. And there, again, there's already, I believe, a bill being presented. Uh, it's just any support from the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee obviously would be helpful. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, Allie? Thanks. Uh, this was just to Stephanie's point earlier on uh, around one of the first recommendations that came to the top. If you scroll up a little bit, I think it was mostly a question, though, if um, if that could be expanded for not just the relocation of mobile homes or if it's also kind of a um, adding on to those homes, of new new housing. I mean, does that can that maybe that's not maybe that doesn't really fit here, but I was just curious if it also could include beyond relocating, taking it a step up. And I'm thinking of Efficiency Vermont's partnership with the modular housing company where they're building um, mobile homes that are extremely energy efficient and, and net zero all, along those lines. Well, I think one thing we agreed to is we can ask, we could add clarifications to these. We don't want to change the specific language. And I'm wondering, is was there, there was also um, under the weatherization, I thought there was something for particularly for rental housing. Here it is, number six, to support landlords in weatherizing rental properties. But then there was one for um, this one, just helping everybody in the process of weatherization and energy efficiency. And I'm wondering if it would be they, you know, that, that those would be adequate. Oh, that's the navigator, sorry. Low income weatherization state assistance program is another one. So there are other weatherization uh, recommendations in here. I'm not sure that they didn't all rise to the top. I think it's- Well, it's not um, specifically weatherization, but it's just if you're relocating mobile homes, then is there also an opportunity to, um, to create new ones that are going to weather future storms better. And that might be through new construction. They have, there are programs that exist. I think it's called EcoMod, but it's through Efficiency Vermont to rebuild mobile homes specifically so that they are more resilient and energy efficient. So you're not just relocating, but you're actually making those communities stronger and more resilient. And adding, and I, I'm wondering too, if there's an opportunity to add additional housing, which we know is, is a critical need. Reactions from others? Yeah, I think I, I I 
I agree. It, it's it's sort of, you know, uh, when you talk about modular housing, people just have this image. And m my response mentally is, get over it. It's perfectly good housing. It is tremendously energy efficient. Uh, and it can be less expensive than stick bill housing any day of the week, you know? And so I'm not sure how you get capture that, but uh, anything to uh, expand people's notions of the usefulness of modular housing is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. I put a link in the chat with some of the programs that are already out there from Efficiency Vermont. Thanks. Thanks for your comment too, David. All right, so here is where we are. I mean, if any, does anybody, just one last question. Um, I wanna share a, another screen uh, that I think Paula put together that really just has the top vote winners. And I just wanna make that so it's easier for you to see them all together. We sent that out also. Um, and I thought maybe we should move there and just have a, a conversation about how what we wanna do with these um, in order to package them or to present them to the um, to the council. Yes, Paula, I'm gonna. Yeah, I was just, um, just as a note, I've made sort of a duplicate of this thing that people are about to see in which I've changed the rationale column to a further considerations column. And I'm trying to take notes on things that we might put in that. Do you um, want to bring it up then list. and share your screen? Would that be easier? Oh, um, sure. sure. It's a little bit of a mess right now, but I can do that. Sure. Um, I think you have screen sharing capability. Not it looks like I do. There you go. Great. Are you seeing the table? Yes. Um, good. I'm going to stick this down here. Um, so like for uh, for this first one, help individuals, municipalities and businesses, I've now like taken out where it said rationale before and I have further considerations. Um, so um, this kind of like is sort of what I think Ann was talking about. Um, sustained assessment should consider and act upon continuing gaps and equitable access to weatherization benefits. Um, so I'm just trying to capture some of the notes that like seem to be pretty have a lot of consensus. Um, but anyway, do you wanna just like walk through, should I make it a little smaller so we can see all of it or is it better to keep it bigger and I can scroll? Uh, I don't know. I, I I don't have any trouble seeing it now, but I, okay. I refer to others. Um, and if you, yeah, I think that if we could see all, all of the sevens together, that might be helpful. <laughs> yeah, so the sevens are in green um, and there were four of them. And then that blue one underneath, it was a six. Great. So now you'll notice that because it's in the order of the voting, it's no longer in the order of, you know, how they were grouped together by theme. Um, but wanted to, uh, David, I see your hand up and I'll call on you in a second. Just would like to, uh, it seems to me we have a couple of ways to proceed. Uh, so let me just throw these out here for further discussion. One is, um, as I said earlier, we could take the seven in that six and say, these are our recommendations. Um, and I think if we wanna do that, we wanna ask ourselves, does this cover the all of the four points that the speaker asked us to cover? Um, is this comprehensive enough? Uh, and to, the, you know, another option is we, we actually incorporate the next tier down, which would be all the fives, that would make it four. Um, but to David's point, maybe we need to be thinking about how to group them in a way that makes it feel like they're, you know, they're linked. And if you're going to work on this one, you need to work on, you know, maybe a couple of them at a, together because they are uh, integral to each other um, to make it much more uh, palatable to the legislature. Um, so, and you'll see, and also in, her, in the column, the far column on the right, we have which committees those would go to, thanks to David, so we can understand better, you know, who would actually possibly have to be uh, taking these up in the coming session. Um, so with that, I just, David, I'll turn it over to you first, if you, because I know you had some ideas for how to lump these together and 
Um, yeah, my hands up um, in terms of uh, this that's on the screen. There is no longer official wildlife commit. Just simply oh, remains okay. that. All right, natural resources and energy, uh, as both House and Senate committees are named, natural resources and energy or close enough. Um, yeah, energy and technology um, is not useful. Also. Oh and wait, then, so uh, I I was going off the names on the website, so they need to probably update that. But um, so natural resources and energy is one, and energy and technology is another. Oops. Oh, David, you're muted. There you yeah, go. no, no. Energy is now net firmly in natural resources. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, Andrea. Uh, I just, I think we should talk about that first one more because um, of the comments made for, you know, to make sure that these are very actionable items that like actually produce results right off. Um, I think you know, have and and the fact that someone said this is maybe happening through the CPRG already, and comments that Ali and Anne made. Um, I don't know. I think we need to either be careful of how this one's worded, or um, make some pointed comments in the considerations, or decide if we want to get rid of this one and instead add something that's more results based or more immediate results based. Not that they won't have an impact if we have these navigators, because of course they would, but I don't know if there's, I just wonder if folks that had comments on this one feel strongly that it shouldn't be included and that there's another one that should be included to, to get to that more immediate action comment. Marion, did you have a response to that specifically? Yeah, well, I checked with Megan O'Toole, who's putting together the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant application and about whether this or something along these lines was being included. And she said it was. They're currently um, talking to community action agencies about increasing capacity for the existing energy coaches role. So it's not exactly sort of creating new um, weatherization and efficiency navigators at RPCs, but it is along similar lines in terms of increasing capacity for sort of existing uh, organizations that take this on. Um, she also noted that, you know, we still have time to, to think about the best, um, the best action or the best um, role to include in the CPRG application. So I think we'll just throw that out there that it, there's an avenue to do this, I think, um, outside of, you know, noting it in this letter. And so if it, it makes sense to maybe take this out or speak to a different action where we know there's sort of, sort of legislative capacity is, is needed and attention should be focused. Um, it sounds like there's, there's discussion about this particular role and need already happening. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the categories was support to help communities and people make decisions. So, I mean, this role is important for sure to, address that but thanks that's helpful very very helpful marion uh ali thank you yes i yeah the the more i think about it i am i'm hesitant to be so specific as to naming the rpcs as you know the role for that navigator i do think it is an important role and there we could do some more thinking and some more um just checking in with the existing organizations that are already doing this work to see where it fits. So I'm glad it sounds like we have some time. Um, and you know, also the navigator role, I think really could belong within the distribution utilities. They, they kind of, they know their customer base the best in terms of um, who has the highest energy burdens, who is struggling to, to pay electricity bills on time, who's experiencing power outages. So I, I don't see them called out specifically. And I think they also, and Efficiency Vermont as well. So yes, I'm a, I think it would be great if we could spend some more time before we get into the specifics of the, of the navigator role. Thank you. Andrea, did you want to add further on this? Her hand's still up, so I was just acknowledging that. She may have stepped away. Um, I, I'm hearing <laughs> sort of a, a 
directional consensus here and wondered, uh, so let me put it forward this way. Does anybody object that this does not move forward as a recommendation and that we look at some of the others to um, maybe take its place? Paula? Yeah, I wonder, so to the second point, I was kind of wondering if people feel strongly about keeping it, we could just leave it at weatherization and efficiency navigators and then make a note that like, you know, the, the CAP had a very specific way of solving this problem, but there might be other ways. Um, as to Marion's point, I'm wondering, like that's more compelling to me as a reason to leave it out um, because it sounds like it's already happening. Like does the legislature even need to act? But I wonder if there is um, a, a benefit in also sort of like looping the legislature in to that as an extra sort of like push behind it. So it remains a priority. Well, let me, let me do this. Let me, um, let's, if you could put a note in that column, just that um, there is uh Um, a, the suggestion that this is being addressed elsewhere and may not need additional legislative attention now and may, in fact, it's how I'm, what I'm hearing is it may need some uh, further consideration of, you know, how to uh, formulate this recommendation. But, um, and then let's come back to it. Let's come back to it at the end after we've talked about some of these others and see if, if there's anybody that feels strongly that it needs to be included and if so, we'll we'll keep it in there with that, with the clarifications we have. All right, let's go to any other questions about the other sevens. We have expand the existing programs. Noted, we need to be specific about what those programs are. To relocate, or at least note what existing programs are out there. To relocate homes and residents in mobile home parks. Um, there was a suggestion that if we, another clarification might be that, um, and I heard the back and forth with you, David, that you know, many of these homes are very energy efficient, but if there's opportunities to uh, increase their climate readiness or their efficiency, that that could be included. Uh, the next one is identify mission critical facilities uh, in collaboration, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, and this is, I think, um, trying to find this in our list. This was the one that came up. Um, I think Michael, you were we were sort of discussing the fact that this could be an umbrella for um, just emphasizing the need for the Act Two Fifty exemptions to be extended. Is that, I got that right? I see you're shaking your Made head. Made permanent. Made permanent. Um, in order to allow for hardening of distribution facilities specifically. Correct, yes. Got it? And you were shaking your head. Did I, there's something not quite right about that, Ann Lawless? I just heard, I heard Michael um, referencing Act 25. Is that, did I mishear that? That that was legislative action last year? Or is that about Act 250? The last year, there was a bill in S100 that created the exemption for distribution utilities from Act 250 under certain criteria. Oh, and I see. But it's Act 250, but it was in House Bill S100. And this year, uh, Catherine, I think I gave you, I don't have them all off the top of my head, but if I haven't given you the bill, I can get that for you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's it would not be an S100 bill. If it's an House Bill, it's an H100. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Thank you. <laughs> so good to have you here, David, to keep us on track. <laughs> um, all right. 
And then the next seven was expand eligibility for existing downtown and village tax credits. We talked about adding, uh, yes, the language that you have there, Paula, consider alternative mechanisms as this might be, you know, cumbersome way to try to incentivize those types of changes. Um, what is, how are people feeling about this as being, again, it's sort of the most actionable, the most urgent that requires legislative attention? Still, yes, Anne. Um, thank you. I'm good with all of these, but do we have? Is there is there sufficient um, push or pull to ask for finding additional revenue to support more home weatherization? So you're saying, are there enough other things that are addressing weatherization that to accompany this? Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we look at some of the others and see if Good. that's the case? So yes, this I, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I strongly agree with Anne's point there. I feel like the first priority is trying to get at that, but I, I, I just don't, I don't think it's going to be in the navigator role. I think it's really an issue of funding to make sure that all of our homes that need it most are, you know, at a bare minimum insulated and air sealed and can get a free home energy audit if that's what's required to do it. But I don't think a navigator role is is going to accomplish that. I think it's really providing the funding for the existing organizations that are doing the weatherization work in our state and also thinking about how we build up the workforce that's going to need to, to sustain it and bring it to scale at the pace that it needs to happen at. So I'd love us to refine that first recommendation and have it be heavily weatherization focused, but not with a focus at the navigator role. Thanks. Um, I think the other thing that, just to remind everyone that um, there are other actions that aren't even included in, we're never included in our poll that of types of things that are already going forward. And I don't know, I mean, if if you know of other things that are already underway uh, on that, on the front of particularly weatherization of homes and businesses, um, I mean, this is yet to come to the, in the letter discussion, but we are thinking about, we need to highlight those as well, potentially, so that they, you know, that, that the legislature realizes that there is a lot already happening. Um, and these are only the things where we were noted that there was no initial implementation going on. Um, I'll just add to that, because I think there was other ones that that were in the poll, whether it was the first poll or the second poll, I'm not sure, but that spoke more directly to something that's a little bit more actional and funding, if I'm not mistaken, about weatherization. But so I think if there's one of those that should be brought up instead of this, or at least in parallel to this, then we, we should make sure we capture that. Okay, Annie? Hi, I, I just wanted to say there's a, there is a lot going on in weatherization. I hear it through osmosis from my colleagues that funding is not a constraint right now, especially there's a whole, a whole lot of ARPA funding, um, a whole lot of uh, IRA funding going into weatherization. Um, I think it would before, I mean, this will come out if it comes into a legislative recommendation and in the legislature and Office of Economic Opportunity who sort of administers the weatherization funds would, would speak to this better than I can, but my impression is that it's not a lack of funding. It is sort of like Ali was talking about the workforce issues um, that are our uh, primary constraint right now. So, you know, to the extent it's helpful, I could ask for kind of a list of all of that. I'm sure we could get it if for, through a request to Office of Economic Opportunity. Obviously the clean heat standard, that is all that kind of development work is going on right now, which that that has materialized since this, these action items and, you know, the climate action plan kind of last came out. So that is a whole other aspect of kind of weatherization um, funding and activity that's going to go on. So I, I guess just to put in context that, it, you know, this this probably will blossom into a larger discussion if it becomes a 
a recommendation from us in the Climate Council and also in the legislature, but just I just don't want anyone to get the impression it's not happening or that there's not a lot of funding. Thanks very much. Um, Paula? Yeah, I kind of was going to make a very similar comment that I think, I think we still need the navigators, like regardless of what else happens. And I think having that as the key thing is important because as um, we were just talking about, like the IRA is also like now this massively huge new thing that people need to navigate on their federal taxes or in other ways. Um, it's really even harder for commercial businesses. Um, so I think to me, like what it sounds like is that we could keep this first part of the actual cap language that goes up to weather and efficiency, weatherization and efficiency navigators, and just, you know, note things in the further considerations about, um, you know, like maybe consider more funding support, but I feel like what I heard before was more like, yeah, after we get this in place, we will still need to know whether it's working, basically, um, which is where this sort of like sustained assessment comment of mine came with. Um, but um, yeah, we might, you know, we can point out that the cap language um, had a specific way of solving the problem that we don't think is the best way. Um, we can bring up the workforce issue, which is massive, like across the country. Um, the IRA has, you know, incentivized all this stuff and there's nobody to install anything. Um, so I feel like I still want to kind of stick with this navigator um, idea as the, as the main thing. And we can say a lot of things in the further considerations about it. David. Um, I, as opposed to a, a, a question, workforce training. I think we ought to make it clear that some portion of available funding should be used to train the workforce necessary to implement the uh, energy conservation. And the reason I say that, and this goes back to, uh, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten who had said it, about an application that is going in for, I guess, federal dollars that will include a um, um, the um, the navigator position or might include the navigator position. All monies, whether they are of state revenue source or federal grants, go through the legislative appropriation process, so that even if another grant was going to envision and fund navigators, someone's got to inform the legislature of where should that money go, what agency, what should it be used for, and they have to agree with the applicant. Um, it's it's not a free-for-all. It, 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 monies that come from federal grants still go through the appropriations process. So, we just need to be clear. Um, yeah, that's good to know. And um, I, I just noted that when I was scrolling through the action plan in preparation for these meetings, that there are workforce development recommendations that we didn't even put in our list, right? Because they weren't rural res directly considered resilience actions, but may also need to just make sure that we acknowledge that those are, if there's something that directly goes to this, that that's in there too. Um, right. And that, that people pay attention. Don't forget, this is going to the speaker. It's going to help set the agenda. And you want to get some buzzwords in people's brains as they're looking at their areas of responsibility that, oh, this was part of that priorities letter. Um, Allie, and then Annie, your hand is still up. So if we come back to you and then I'd like to just move through the rest of these so that everybody has a chance to see the full picture here. Thank you. Yes, um, I think just to go back to Paula's point, yeah, perhaps ending it, putting a period right after navigators would work. I did wanna ask the group if they thought what they thought about 
the role of the navigators living more within the distribution utilities, perhaps with oversight from Efficiency Vermont. I do think that in terms of uh, the, the knowledge of, of who needs the support most based on energy burden and uh, you know, inability to pay bills on time, et cetera. Perhaps they are they've they've got the data to to work with. Um, so I'd be curious with GMP here or if others have thoughts on that. And um, and then I just wanted to also say uh, thank you to to Anne at uh, PSD for reminding us. Yes, there is a. You're right. There is a considerable amount of funding that is already out there and a lot of people that are already working on this so um but we're 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 seeing some of the shortcomings in in the northeast kingdom specifically where the cost of audits have gone up substantially if you're paying for them yourself and those um were we know that there's considerable need for more weatherization but people aren't signing up for it so what can we do to make sure that people are accessing those benefits in our most vulnerable areas. So Ali, could I just ask if we could put sort of in the parking lot for now, your first comment, which is, you know, maybe there's another avenue that's better given that I'm not sure we're gonna be in a position to make that that specific a recommendation yet, but we could certainly raise it up as, you know, the other other avenues or other other channels for those types of navigators should be considered. Um, and I want to make sure we have enough time for the rest of these. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, but, uh, just so you know, I agree that okay. it ought to be the fuel people that because they have the, and I don't mean just electricity, I mean fuel, um, because they have the knowledge of people who are in trouble. Michael? Well, yeah, all I was going to add on that is BEIC is in the list. That is Efficiency Vermont. And uh, they actually, that all went from us to them back when they were created. So they already do a lot of that. Uh, certainly, we would help any way we could. Uh, but right now, the grants and everything lie within uh, BEIC and Efficiency Vermont to do that work. Uh, we are starting to move into the home a little uh, again with the power storage, the uh, energy storage and things like that. So certainly if there's something that utilities could help with, I'm, I'm sure we would. Uh, but VEIC already has that set up and they're doing that. That was not why I rose my hand. Uh, I just wanted to get the information correct on the previous comments we had on the critical infrastructure. Even though it did start in House Energy and Environment, it ended up in a Senate bill S-100. So it was S-100 that that was in, uh, and there is no bill this year for it, but that's where it was passed last year. Thank you. Got it. Great. All right. So we were, um, I think we've covered all the sevens, and let's, did we cover all the sevens? One, two, three. If we could scroll down to... The six there, uh, establish a dedicated comprehensive state level program with funding to strategically purchase and match or match funding for hazard prone properties. Um, this got six, haven't had much discussion about it. Wanna just this ask, is, confirm that- Oh, this is the one uh, Stephanie spoke to. This is the- Flood Resilient Communities Fund. So it's an already, it's an existing program. Um, there were notes, I don't know if it was in your spreadsheet, Catherine, about, but it's currently funded with ARPA dollars, which are running out. Which are running out. Oh, anyway, right. we, we discussed, we should be noticed. maybe just in a different document on additional context to add here. It's called the Flood Resilient Communities Fund. Yep, got it. Okay, then we had four recommend ac actions that fell within five votes. You can see them all there, um, all colored in yellow. So auditing the existing residential building codes, we had a lot of discussion about that. Um, and the fact that there is no statewide single family residential building code. So we need to type the clarification there. Um, 
let's see my notes there. Um, and that was where, David, I think you suggested that a study would maybe be the precursor to any actual legislative action on that, uh, that they would have to look at what would be needed to make the, the codes generally, state code generally more climate ready. Yeah, we're certainly ready, not ready to do anything. Uh, and the legislature would want to study it, I'm sure. Any other comments about that one? Are people feeling that that is still actionable in terms of, I mean, it's it, it sounds like that requires that initial step to take further action, but. I was thinking the that thing I would add, whoops, sorry. Sorry, we, neither one of us raised our hand, I don't think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can go um, first. Andrew. Okay, if I can remember now. Oh, I just said, um, I think we should definitely um, reference the other action that Anne brought up and that Stephanie spoke to as some action happening on that. And I can't remember the exact language. It's in the chat. Um, consider statewide that. adoption of residential building codes. And Stephanie spoke to that. FEMA is... Oh, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. No, you have it right. DFS is looking into uh, getting some grant money to work on a study to evaluate a residential building code. Now, that's really quickly, Eric. Though, does that include any consideration of climate change impacts? You know, like what they'll be what they'll be looking at and feasibility for that. I don't know if it goes into climate. I, it, has efficiency and obviously safety, but seems like climate impact could be in there. Mm -hmm. And again, if it's a grant to the state, it goes through the appropriations process. So it would require attention by the legislature, even as even if you're seeking that funding through a grant program. Okay. And again, um, no fish and wildlife committee. Thank you. I'll fix them all, but um, yeah, thanks for. The next one is authorize the creation of multi-stakeholder committee process with funding to support the development of a statewide land use planning policy and implementation plan that guides development to growth areas. This I think came, yeah, this was compact, this compact development recommendation. Uh, haven't had any discussion about this yet. Anybody? Um, yeah, I have a question. Yep. Whose committee is this? Uh, is it a legislative committee? Is it a committee com uh, convened by the Secretary of uh, Commerce and Community Development or? Um, so who yeah. would they report to and who would? And who does it logistic uh, support and, and, um, it's just this committee hanging out there that I didn't quite sure what it was attached to. Is that something that the legislature could determine where it best sits? Because I don't think we have language in the the climate action plan. I think this is the well the the administration would have to at least uh, put forward some claim. To where they wanted it to go. I mean, the legislature, I'm sure, would do it. But if uh, an administrative agency doesn't particularly want to do something, it may get done, but likely not well. So, uh, you know, some leadership is needed um, in both the administration and the legislature. Paula and Andrea? Um. Yes, actually, Andrea, you should go because mine was back on the um, building codes. Okay, and that, Michael might have had a comment on that one too that maybe we didn't get to. But for this one, um, I just wonder how the 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 actions that are happening through ACCD right now, the um, designation sort of reform or whatever they're calling it, um, relates to this. I know they're talking about resilience in that, so I don't know. Um, I feel like it's if Bronwyn were here, she could speak to more more to that, but maybe Marianne, you can, but it seems like there's already action in this space. So but I might not understand that completely though. So if it's different, 
Okay, and if that's the case, then Commerce and Economic Development Committees in both the House and Senate will have an interest. That's their agency. So yeah, I would I add Commerce to your committee list. That study, Andrea, it's related, but is really looking specifically at just the designated areas um, that fall within the that ACCD designation program. And I think this action is speaking to looking at land use yeah, policy and um, statewide um, outside of those des designated areas. So I think it's a little bit of a different focus, um, but we could reference it as a related action. Because um, you're right, that that study is is looking at climate resilience, but for those designated areas only. Any other comments about this one? And then I understand we got to go back to building codes. Yeah, I actually did have one about this because one of the other ones I wanted to ask about way back at the beginning of the meeting was why people um, didn't um, vote for the Act 250 reform. Um, and maybe that's just like a giant juggernaut mess. Um, and that's why. But I am I am a little bit curious to hear that because um, this is sort of like a mini version of like, let's redo Act 250. <laughs> so. Yeah, we got Act 250 got four votes. So it just fell below our threshold that we're talking about right now. Um, Jens? Yeah, I just wanted to speak to to this one about uh, implications for state land use planning and how much bigger that is than Act 250. The vast majority of subdivision in Vermont doesn't trigger Act 250. Only about 2% of subdivision actually triggers Act 250. So if you wanna look at the pattern of land use across the state and actually make a system that's resilient and adaptive for and allows for wildlife adaptation, for example, uh, you have to go beyond Act 250 and actually look at zoning statewide. Uh, and so this one is, is critically important and going way beyond the, the designation, the, you know, the village designations or the downtown designations it is crucially important to maintaining that overall pattern. The default, I'll just one more sentence, the, you know, the default land use pattern in Vermont is sprawl. Um, it's the agricultural, uh, it's the rural and residential zoning districts that see the most growth. We are not growing in our downtowns. Uh, and so if you wanna address the larger pattern, this is the way to do it. Uh, the, the designation programs in my estimation are great, but unless we actually invest in development in those downtowns and have you know, city water and city sewer, uh, it really doesn't matter where we say we want development, we're going to default to sprawl. Thank you. It's 10.30. Wow, that was very passionate and clear. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Okay, um, do we wanna go to the next one or go back to buildings? Somebody, you had some comments on buildings, either Michael and Paula, did you both have a comment on buildings code? I'll, I'll, mine was really just a comment that uh, there is actual electrical uh, codes for single family residential. It's the national electric code Yeah, that, that people, homeowners and electricians are supposed to be following for single family homes. What there isn't other than in a few select towns is an inspection process for a single family home. So the electricians and homeowners are supposed to be following. And I don't even know if you need <laughs> to write this down, but they are supposed to be following national electric code but uh, not every town has an inspection process for single family homes. Uh, labor and industry does do all the inspections for uh, multi-family homes. Thanks. Yeah, my uh, comment on the housing, on the building code one is that I just find it kind of egregious that we don't have a um, low rise and single family uh, residential building code. Um, and so I, I feel like we should be including this in our recommendations. Um, because if we don't even have like the basics beyond, you know, like the very narrow, uh, electric and plumbing codes, like that's already a problem, um, mitigation wise. Um, and then on top of it, like there's no resilience or adaptation, um, work being built into any new development. 
and new development is going to be increasing within migration. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna do a quick time check here. We have sort of run over our public comment period and I wanna make sure there are no individuals that wanted to make a public comment to respect their time for waiting through this. Marion, do we have anybody from the public? No, okay. Um, that the other time check I want is that we have 30 minutes left. Um, we wanna be, be sure that we have time to discuss the letter um, so let's keep moving quickly through these last couple. And again, I think this has been really, really helpful to get these additional considerations, um, clarifications on the record so that we those can go forward with the rec with the um, specific action. So I think continuing this is is important. So and we have a couple more left um, before we talk about them as a whole package. So one of the ones is uh, the last one is create a permanent state fund for design and implementation of local and regional climate adaptation resilience projects. This is a funding request. Um, and then the last one, the public service department should ensure all utilities provide similar opportunities for all customers uh, to receive rebates and incentives. I'm gonna throw out this question to you. Uh, for that last one in particular, as to whether or not that requires legislative action, uh, given that it's within the jurisdiction of the Public Service Department. Um, so um, whether that even belongs in this group or not. And I think there's others that are better suited to answer that question than than me. Anne? Thanks. Um, that I think you just, uh, you went to something that was Going to my point, which was that I think we're actually the wrong actor here. The Public Service Department doesn't have that ultimate authority to make this happen. Um, if anyone, it would be the Public Utility Commission. And they may, I, I anticipate they would also say they don't have the legislative authority to require this. There is a whole um, section of statute that directs how um, the utilities, the utilities, just like electric rates, they, they set their own tier three incentives. And in the energy transformation programs under tier three, um, there's a whole section of statute and on another corollary section of rule about, you know, the requirements for setting those tier three incentives, which are designed to reduce fossil fuel consumption um, for customers un under required certain amounts every year. Um, and you know, utilities can do those through custom projects, like a few big custom projects, there or a lot of prescriptive projects, um, like your heat pump rebates, that sort of thing. So it's really like a, a custom design by utilities, and the legislature could require the exact same prescriptive measures, and that the then the commission would have to enforce that. And we, the department, would make comments to the commission saying they are or not exactly the same um, if if we had to. Also, I mentioned earlier the clean heat standard. This may apply as much, if not more, to the implementation of a clean heat standard. Um, and so I just I thought that should be brought up. And also the final thing was that, you know, the same incentives may not be sufficient. It may be may need more incentives. You may need more incentives for certain customer classes. Um, these are just some things that'll come out if this rises to the top. Thank you. Thank you. That was super helpful. And um, so it would be the Public Utility Commission that would would need the authority. And you're saying they don't currently have the authority. They would need the legislature to give them the authority to direct the utilities. It's That's my anticipation is they would say that they don't have the explicit authority or mandate to do that. Okay. Okay. Other comments on uh, either of these two last... Paula, or yeah, Paula. No, David, your hand is up. Sorry, misreading my screen. Um, I think the uh, cre create a permanent fund for design implementation uh, is duplicative for the most part with what is already um, uh, the call for resources to do hardening of of infrastructure and 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 whatever um and if we're looking to uh delete certain things this would be uh one where we could um 
just drop it. If we don't drop it, then in terms of the legislative committee, if you're talking about money, um, it's got to go appropriations, natural resources and energy and appropriations. You would have a jurisdictional committee and then have to be willing to spend the money. Any other comments on either of these two? I would agree on David with that one because VTrans, the electrical energy companies, we've actually already have designs for hardening and, and we've been doing it for years and years and years. So this is a little bit of the uh, cart after the horse. And I just don't know how much is needed here. We at least have a couple folks arguing that this is not one that should go all the way to the top. Um, All right. So Paula, um, I think I wanted to just shift. I'm, I'm sorry. And the, the, the final one, um, we, we need to figure out how to incorporate that in the, um, uh, the, um, priority above, uh, not, not immediately above, but, um, uh, the, the, that whole discussion about navigators, um, this is what a navigator would do, encourage fossil fuel reduction, electrification, energy savings. And so I don't know that it needs to be broken out twice, maybe just a, a, a quick expansion of the, the word navigator to incorporate this. I, but it seems duplicative again. Thumbs up from Allie there. Paula? I would agree with that. And also, I really just didn't understand the wording of this. Like, is it trying, is it trying to, uh, like, it seems like the emphasis, the, the active words are um, similar opportunities for all customers. And I just don't understand what is the problem that's, a, that's solving. Um, so is it like, because people in the middle class have a harder time accessing them? I think um, Ann may have answered it in the comments. It, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, I missed that. Thank you. Is that what you think it means, Ann Lawless? Yeah, it's basically it's basically an equity issue between our different electric utilities all provide very, very different um supports, rebates, and incentives. If I lived in Green Mountain Power District. I would be a much richer woman than um, living in um, Lindenville Electric area. Yeah, and I would I would just quickly add to that that sort of speaks to the opportunity for Efficiency Vermont VEIC to have yeah. some more oversight in sort of the equitable distribution of those resources. I know, Michael, you just mentioned like the, the hardening efforts that are happening on GMP's grid is different for, for some of the, the muni or co-op electric uh, companies in, in the Northeast Kingdom, for instance. We are talking to all of them, just so everyone knows, and letting them know our findings and, and everything. So we are talking to them. Uh, I guess I'll end it there. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Marianne, you had your hand up earlier too. Well, just because the navigators piece came up again and um, just hearing from Megan again, who's putting together the climate pollution reduction grant work, she noted that you no know, conversations are still happening, but the concept of helping uh, low-income folks navigate all of the weatherization and fuel switching programs will be included in the CPRG in some way. Um, so again, I, I think fine if we want to, you know, include it as well, but I think worth noting that that conversation is happening and, and doesn't require legislative action, um, at least for inclusion in the CPRG. All right. Um, I want to take us back to this question of how many uh, we want to move forward. Uh, we have already talked about possibly um, taking a few of these off this list even in the five category and one of them we've been back and forth on the on in in the seven category so um 
I think the uh, was it the navigator has you know if it was to move forward, it it comes with a lot of of additional um, high things to highlight workforce development, um, how this you know there is ac action already being considered around this. The fact that we're, we would cut this off and not make a recommendation specifically about where these navigators would need to be placed, that that could be open for further you know, discussion and clarification. So all of those uh, conditions, I would say, or clarifications were raised about this one. Um, and I said I'd come back to this. Uh, Paula, you made a, a strong case that we included along with all of those um, elaborations. Uh, does anybody feel that we should not include this? I mean, is there a strong feeling that it should not be included if we, again, include the elaborations we've noted? Okay. Um, Paula. <laughs> Sorry, I'm actually like, you said I made a strong case for it. And I'm like, yeah, I did that. And then I like felt a lot more strongly about the building code thing than I did about this, um, partly because of what Marian is, has told us about what's already happening. And so like whether this should be a legislative priority um, and especially given like the amount of hedging we have to put in the next column, I'm feeling differently about it now, I think. Um. I wonder if there is some room within the, the navigator piece as a recommendation. I'm not sure if this is entirely appropriate coming from us, but something along like guidance around the expectations of who is who will benefit from these programs mm -hmm. if there's some goal setting. I don't know if there if that is something that that our we have a role to play in, but sort of suggesting that we would like the navigator role to provide services to those that are most vulnerable, or we can, you know, sort of fine tune those specifications. Is that something that makes sense here? Yes. So if we were to keep it, it would be to emphasize that, that it needs to be particularly targeting lower income, more vulnerable to climate impacts. Yeah, I like it. I also heard when we had this discussion was that you wanted to see more emphasis on, on just opportunities for weatherization. That was then met with a discussion around whether is a lot of money going into weatherization, a lot of activities. How are people feeling about that now? Do we have enough already to address that if this is sort of the starting place? What we don't have is the workforce. I think that has to stay in there as an active part of uh, this. Yes. Overall, I, I, you know, I, I ran a community action agency. I ran a weatherization program. I'll tell you, I'll take all the money I can get. All right. I mean, uh, I, I, and that's only partially facetious because the, the, you know, give me a 25% increase in eligible household income and I could probably double expenditures. So, um, I, I wouldn't sell short the notion that additional resources would help. All right, so I'm feeling a little anxious about our time. <laughs> We've got 15 minutes left. We do want to, to talk about the letter. Our challenge here has been, how narrow do we want to narrow? <laughs> and um, although we've, we've had some great qualifications and clarifications put in here, we haven't really significantly narrowed. Can I just take a gut reaction? How are people feeling about forwarding I think we are, again, our two choices are probably forwarding the top five, since we haven't really taken any out of that, or forwarding the top five along with uh, the all the fives, which would bring us up to nine. I just, I need 
some sense of where is a group we we feel like we're going here. There were a couple at the bottom that we did take out. I so I do yeah, think we the two we at the we, bottom. Hopefully, we've taken out two. Yeah. Uh, so now we're up to seven. Marion. I think I've articulated this and Val had a comment about this in the chat as well. I'd like to see that we're um, including actions for each of the four requests in the speaker's letter. And we'll note, I think, um, you know, keeping in mind the requests um, stemmed from a conversation about the flooding this summer. I think we are broadening the response of that to include sort of an all hazards approach and and um, including sort of weatherization and access for low income um, folks, but but I think keeping in mind, one, ensuring that we're um, including actions that sort of fit under those four buckets generally, um, and that we're, and I think if we get to it today, a conversation too about gaps um, based on based on where those actions land. So anyway, I say that, and then I guess my inclination would be to include more or to ensure that we have, we've sort of covered those four categories. Uh, far be it for me to ever, ever, ever second guess a speaker of the house <laughs> but what makes those four priorities sacrosanct? Uh, why can't we address three I, and i just offer that as a, a a different thought that i'm not sure if we can respond to all four fine but i wouldn't bend our priorities too far in order to have four responses. And we may in fact have covered all four of those. I think Paula tried to do an initial kind of uh, ground truthing of that to see if we were, and she she at least came up with some, just even in the top five that covered, fell into those categories. So I'm not sure, I think, I think we've done a pretty good job. Um, that's my gut reaction. Um, so I'm hearing some some um, support for let's let's leave it at these seven. Um, I just want to do a double check. Anybody would object to that strongly object to that, including all of these building codes. And Paula, I'm sorry, but I'm going to speak against including it because it carries its own baggage that has nothing to do with climate change or anything else. Um, uh, it, it will be a lightning rod in terms of, uh, land, uh, uh, landowners and, 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 uh, landlords and, um, um, as long as, and, uh, so it should be just the study, just ask for the study. Don't mm. go beyond that. Okay. That would be, yeah, that one, which got five. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it, I'm going to, I'm going to call this a package for the moment, not hearing any other clarifications. I'm going to turn it over to Paula. Well, Paula, you already have the uh, the screen. So if you want to switch to the, um, the letter, make sure we get any comments on the letter, and then we'll talk about next steps. Yeah, I'm just going to stop my share for a second so I can find it. <laughs> Three, two... I'm sure you saved that document. That's very important. <laughs> oh, I did. I just needed to find the right one, right version in my file system, which nobody needs to see. Do you see it now? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Um, I will mention that the current one has her priorities listed and saying um, we have grouped our recommendations in the four categories, which in the current table that we're looking at, we didn't, so that would slightly change. Um, but other than that, I think, yeah, it's in a pretty good place. Um, where would people like to focus? 
Yeah, there were not a lot of changes. I mean, you mean most of your changes were in, in describing the categories we had before and all that uh -huh. stuff. So um, now it talks more about how it we, we arrived at these and it does mention the prior that there that this really focuses on actions not taken. Um and uh it it references at the end the the fact that there is a lot of stuff going on and he you know tries to summarize some of that in the documents that some of the state agencies put together. Should we remove disaster recovery from funding like we did on the earlier federal and state funding? Yeah. I think disaster recovery is too narrow personally. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of with David on this one. Like, why did she just ask about that? Like, <laughs> So if people want to take that out, that's fine with me. And I think Andrea we, had we us remove it, it from something else earlier too. Uh, so it would match that. Okay, why don't we do that? David, get a comment? Uh, we, we, um, I don't think we just removed it. Didn't we replace it with a broader? Yeah, uh, just funding as opposed to disaster recovery funding. It was more open. Right. Oh, okay, okay. So am I, am I just taking disaster recovery out? Yes. Great. Paula, do you want to make your case here for highlighting some of the actions that are already underway that people think are, you know, that just to remind the legislature that we do have, because we attack, if they, if we rely on them to look at all of those attachments, it's going to, they're going to have to wade through quite a lot. Yes. So one of the things that I was sort of realizing is that this is really the only line here um, that I have highlighted right now um, that says um, our process for arriving at these. And so I was thinking maybe we could do like up above um, before we start um, sort of, I don't know, at some point in this letter before we start on like what the recommendations are, I think it's important for us to be very clear that these are things that aren't being worked on yet. Um, and then maybe pull out um, three things or three themes of stuff that's either already being implemented, is completed or is in progress. Um, and then I was going to like try to like figure out and write down what those themes might be. And then I thought, well, I think maybe we should just like talk about whether we even want that paragraph first and what people think um, we should highlight as like broad, like two or three broad themes that are already in play. What do you think about that idea? I mean, I think of B-Trans, they're already doing things but certainly they could use more funding to to do more right and it's the same thing with distribution hardening for all the utilities they're already doing it but uh the infrastructure act actually designated dollars for utilities that would then fund some of these projects where the customers wouldn't have to fund those so i think some of those are already happening but it doesn't mean that more couldn't happen and be part of the infrastructure act so I don't think we can say those are part of things not already happening, right? Are, are, we are in fact going to include those reports yes. uh, that were made at the last meeting, is that correct? Yes. And um, I understand that there's a lot there and that uh, legislators, you know, you want to do three bullet points and or they lose interest or whatever, uh, that's not true of all legislators. And I would, in the body of the letter to the speaker, ask her to challenge her leadership team to be aware of what is in those attachments. I mean, don't just, don't let them off the hook. Because I, I don't I don't want to those reports, I mean it was overwhelming sitting and listening to them, but um, I don't want them ignored either. Uh, 
because some people have done some very good work. So you would do that in lieu of actually calling anything specific out? Yes, I, I, I would, because then if you call out three things in particular, you let them off the hook. Okay, I hear that. Well, if that's the way we're to go, are there any other comments then um, in terms of the content of the letter? Anything you think is missing or needs to be raised up? Everybody feeling good about this letter? All right. Great job, Paula. Uh, yeah, drafting. we were on board last week. <laughs> yep. Drafting team. Okay. Um, so next steps. Uh, this, we're supposed to be prepare these materials for, I, do we have at least close of business Monday, Marion, for posting to, for the uh, Climate Council meeting on December 18th. They have to be posted seven days in advance. Um, they don't have to be posted seven days in advance, but it's a courtesy to give the council seven days to review it. Okay. Just has to be posted two days in advance, but we should shoot for, for more than that. Um, it feels like we have the package. We have agreement around the package of recommendations. We've eliminated two, uh, so we're down to seven. We have had a great discussion around some clarifications and sort of amendments that need to be made to the not amendments. They're not really changing the action language itself, but um, some additional uh, amplification of those. That needs to be wordsmithed, obviously, uh, and put in a little more formal language. Um, the table that um, Paula prepared had a sort of uh, additional considerations. I don't, you know, we, so that's where that would all go. And then we had that column that also had the uh, legislative committees that would be considering it, people feeling comfortable with leaving that in as part of the table that we would move forward in the body of the letter that would go into the body of the letter. So the table that Paula showed that we were working on, we would take out the votes um, and just include them. Um, I can see where it might be helpful uh, if we take out the votes to actually put them in an order that is mm, at least puts together some of the things that have, are similar. So the building recommendations together, the weatherization recommendations together, the uh, statewide funding recommendations together, the way they were in the original poll, just because that has some logic to it. That would be my other suggestion. How do people feel about that? Yes, okay. I think theme by themes makes sense. Um, so, that's the work that we need to do. And um, if, if anybody wants to, we have our drafting committee, we had, um, so we could continue to work with them on trying to get this finalized. I'm wondering if anybody else wants to join that group before we finalize this for Monday and how important it, it, would you like to see it again one more time before it gets posted for the council? So we can build that into the schedule. Or do you have faith in your drafting committee? It has done an excellent job. I'd be interested in joining. Okay, great, Allie. Good. Um, you may end up just we doing this through email. I'm not sure how whether we're going to have another time for another meeting on Monday, but if we need to, we might have a just-in-time scheduling for a meeting if there's any open-ended questions that we still have. Um, so uh, with that, what else do we need to consider before getting this finalized and up? I'm trying to remember, I missed anything. Well, I think it's worth noting too that um, likely counselors who are on this committee will be the ones presenting it to the council on the 18th. So David, Paula, Ali, Eric, I think who else um so you all should discuss sort of 
process for presenting and, and sort of sharing this. I believe there's not a whole lot of, well, I have to check. I'm not, I haven't seen the draft agenda yet. I'm not sure how much time you guys have, but once I see that, I can let you know. Well, we have a biomass uh, discussion that's going to take a lot of time, I presume. I, uh, it always has. <laughs> yes, there are a number of other objectives on the agenda. So I think uh, attempting to keep it concise and clear in your remarks uh, would probably be appreciated. Because yes, I there will be a biomass agenda item. I'm not sure if this is coming before that. So could drag on. Do we have a nomination for somebody to, to do that presentation? Paula. Also, yeah, Paula's been very much involved. Tag, um, you're it. Paula, would you be up for the task? I'm willing to do it, but I'm also like if the letter group um, sort of like finds another front person, that's also okay with me. Well, but you you know the text of that letter and that's going to- Yeah, be that's true. Of, yeah. Of, so, so Paula, I think if you're willing, uh, we'll designate you as the presenter for the council and okay. um, council meeting. And I think with that, we've covered just about everything. Thanks all. This has been a rapid paced uh, task and I appreciate everybody that's put the time in to, to make this happen. Um, so with that, I'll let you go and have a great weekend. Yeah, I have one last comment, which is Excellent. that I am so grateful for you, Catherine. You're like sitting on a plane, like editing documents and having me having Zoom meetings with us. And I'm just so in awe of your ability to like just hold this process for us. So thank you. Well, it's been great to be back involved. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Later all.